everybody, and welcome. We're so excited that you are joining us today uh, with really our expert panelists. It's great to have everybody here uh, and with us. Just, uh, everyone's on now, so you can all say hi. Everyone can see you at home. So we really had gotten a lot of questions at the Federation just about real estate in general and, and what it means during this time and what you can do, what you can't do, best practices. So we assembled a fantastic panel of experts to help you and to guide you along this way. So today we have David with Freedom Mortgage, Ken with Morgan Law, Nikki David and Ben Landsberg, our realtors that are going to walk us through everything today. So we're just gonna go ahead and get started. So David, we are actually gonna go ahead and start with you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Charlene, and good afternoon to everybody. And um, thank you for participating uh, in this in this panel. So, mortgage rates. Um, one of the positives of this current crisis is that mortgage rates are at their all-time lowest, and that applies to anyone who's interested in refinancing a current mortgage or is, is looking to uh, acquire a property. Um, currently, on a 30-year fixed rate, we're probably talking somewhere in the low threes, a 15-year mortgage, we're probably looking at about 2.5%. So that's good news. And the better news is that uh, going forward, based on some shifts uh, from government actions, we think that mortgage rates are going to go lower than where they are now uh, to the point where uh, your 30 year fixed rate mortgage will at some point in time, and I'm not sure when, will get below 3%, which has never happened in the history of mortgages, which means also that your uh, 15 year mortgage rates will drive down even lower to somewhere perhaps around two and a quarter percent. Uh, in our business, we foresee this moving in this direction, at least through the rest of the year, certainly based on what's gonna happen, what's happening with the economy now, what's gonna happen with the economy throughout the rest of this year. Um, and by the way, it also not only applies to residential properties, but if you have an investment property, investment property rates are a little bit higher than residential rates, but they're still very appealing at this point in time. So the question becomes, you have a current mortgage, you're potentially looking to refinance that mortgage. What, uh, what are your uh, opportunities at this point in time? So uh, that depends on, on, on some different factors. Number one, is your mortgage with a big bank, big commercial bank like a Wells Fargo or a JP Morgan, or is it with a non-bank lender, such as our company, Freedom Mortgage? The difference being that big banks have the capital to finance residential mortgages, non-banks do not. So we leverage what are, what are called warehouse lines of credit to help with that, with that process. Currently, the big banks are a little shy uh, on, the, on the lending side. It's typically what occurs when you have situations such as this. So big banks, um, their, their standard is what's called conventional lending, where the investor is Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. So my understanding with a lot of the big banks is in order to either finance a new new mortgage or refinance a current mortgage. Uh, their standards for being able to do that loan are much higher than before the crisis. So then you, you need to have uh, a credit, uh, a FICO score, probably around 740 or 750. And you need to have liquid assets as reserves, probably somewhere around $250,000. Non-bank lenders are a little bit more on the flexible side, companies such as ours. We do conventional lending, but most of ours 
uh, uh, most of our business is really on government lending. Uh, that is where the investor is Ginny May. So those type of uh, programs or FHA, uh, VA, we do a lot of business um, with, with the veterans and a little bit on the USDA, which is on rural housing. Uh, pertaining to that type of lending where your credit score is not so much of an, uh, uh, of an issue. Um, you know, it's a little bit more lax and the opportunities for your average borrower out there are much more outstanding than let's say if you're a conventional borrower. Um, also part of um, being a government lender and we're, we're experiencing that right now is on what's called streamlined financing. So, you know, that process eliminates going through the whole verification process regarding tax returns and, and, and FICO credit scores and credit reports and so on. So um, it, it, what it really, what it does in, in a very expedient manner is we can take a borrower, let's say that has an interest, current interest rate of 4% and we could put them in a three and a quarter percent and you know the process is, is much more is much less cumbersome than the typical uh, mortgage standard. Um, another big issue right now because of the crisis is forbearance. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been reading up on that. Uh, it's, it's been in play now probably for about uh, two months uh, when the CARES Act was passed by the, uh, by the legislature. Uh, simply put, if you are a borrower, and regardless of whether you're a Ginny May, Freddie Mac, or Fannie Mae investor, you could simply request of your servicer uh, to have a forbearance of your loan. That's as simple as it gets. There's no verification process that's in place. If you call up your servicer and you request a forbearance because you have financial difficulties, the investor or uh, the servicer is required to give you that forbearance. That does not mean that the debt goes away. What it really means is that that is, is, is um, pushed back uh, to the end of the mortgage term. Uh, be careful with that from the standpoint that once you request a forbearance and granted that forbearance, you can cancel that forbearance if your economic condition uh, proves and you can start making payments. But for now, the big challenge is that if you ask for a forbearance and you are you are looking to refinance your mortgage or get a new loan, you will not get that loan. Um, right now on, on the government lending and the conventional lending, that's a rule that's currently in place. Uh, we will call that an oversight when uh, the CARES Act was passed. Uh, the government lenders and the conventional lenders, the investors are working on that to see if some of that can be um, reduced. So instead of waiting a year in order to refinance your mortgage or get a new mortgage loan, uh, possibly three or four months. And hopefully you will see that uh, you know, very soon. Obviously, a lot of this is novel, and you know, things are being done, I guess, on a, on on a, on the run as uh, we go along during this process. Um, I guess the last thing I, I want to add is, if you are looking to refinance your mortgage or uh, get a new loan, uh, the process is probably at best anywhere between 45 to 60 days. Uh, I know that seems like a long time, a month and a half to two months. Every lender, especially non-back lenders that are, that are out there, are seriously backlogged. And I, I could tell you from with our business, the um, increase in the pipeline from the end of the year when the rates were you know, low at that point in time to where we are now uh, probably has tripled. So with that, even as we add more resources 
just the sheer volume of, of what is going on out there in the world uh, has caused this backlog. So if you're patient and you work with your lender, whether it's us or somebody else, you will eventually um, have your mortgage closed and and be paying that much less money in your in your monthly payment. So thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to me, and I'm uh, happy to answer any and all questions after uh, everybody else gets a chance to speak. Perfect. Thank you so much, David. That was, I think, a lot of information, and, and we do have a few questions. I'll, um, I'll read them out, but I just want to let a few other people jump in um, and uh, let everything you just said soak in. Uh, that's, you know, the 2.5% mortgage on the 15-year fixed is, is really new to everybody. So um, I, I put it in the chat, the Q&A feature. We already have one question coming in that we'll get to, but any questions for any of our panelists, please put there. And, uh, and I think I did not mention at the top, I'm Charlene Green, hi everybody, uh, Jewish Federation of Southern New Jersey, and we are happy to be hosting this panel for everybody. So now I'm going to actually hand it over to uh, Ken and with Morgan Law and uh, to, to share more from his perspective. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Charlene. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the bad news because I think I wanna get that out of the way. Everyone's heard nothing but bad news for the last couple months, so. You know, the bad news is over one and a half million unemployment claims have been filed in New Jersey alone in, in a seven to eight week period, which is unprecedented. unprecedented. And as a result, a lot of deals have fallen through and the pool of attractive buyers is lower. And where deals have fallen through, and in some cases, depending on the deal, buyers have lost their deposits, um, but you know, just have walked away from deals because of, you know, losing their job or, or uncertainty or fear. Um, so, um, you know, something to think about if you are a seller is really focus on whether the buyer can actually get to the closing table. Not, you know, don't necessarily go with the highest bid if someone's a much stronger and a much lower risk of, um, you know, having a problem, more contingencies. Um, the good news is that houses are being shown in New Jersey and buyers are attracted to the great rates that David mentioned. The interest rates are the lowest they've been in my lifetime. So um, while they may go lower, um, as David mentioned, you know, there, there's no reason to hesitate. The, the rates are phenomenal. Um, if you can conquer your fear and go forward with a deal as a, as a buyer, you ought to be careful about looking at including mortgage contingencies, sales contingency of your existing house, and employment contingencies to your contract. Obviously, that's not going to be very attractive to a seller, but you need to protect yourself. So consider that. Also, the, the realtor form of residential contracts have recently added a COVID-19 addendum, which allows for extensions of closing dates based on delays caused by the pandemic. And uh, in most cases, it's a 30 day, up to 30 days. Some cases, it's 10. Obviously, read the addendum and, and see what it says. But nobody really has control over the process like they did um in more normal times so it's something to keep in mind for example if you're a buyer and you're getting inspections people have had difficulty getting certificates of occupancy if required in a certain municipality haddonfield for example requires a sidewalk inspection so these kind of things where the government has been shut down and unable to do the inspections and issue the reports have caused some delays into deals all houses in New Jersey must get a smoke and carbon monoxide detector inspection and certificate. So, you know, that has also caused delays as well. And your realtors who are gonna follow me speaking can guide you through the process, you know, and when things open up, which hopefully that's in the very near future, these inspectors are gonna have a very large pile of paperwork on their desk to get through. So best to be on the top of the pile than the bottom of the pile, so keep that in mind. If you are actually fortunate enough to get to a closing, closings have changed a little bit these days. 
title companies are asking the realtors not to attend if possible. They're trying to get sellers to pre-sign and pre-notarize closing documents uh, with a listing agent or a seller available by email to sign settlement, sign or fax settlement statements and similar last minute documents. Title companies are trying to do remote closings where the parties don't need to attend. You know, in, in, in this, these days with technology, there's really not a reason for people to attend every single closing and it's much more efficient to get your documents signed and delivered in advance um, and mail in the documents. And in fact, some title companies are now having drive-through closings where in the parking lot, you drive up, you sign in your car and you hand your documents. So they're doing whatever they can to minimize the, the health concerns. Um, so the timing is a little bit different, but you know, creative minds find a way to get deals done. Um, one of the challenges that some people are experiencing is that the recording offices haven't been up to date in terms of recording the documents. As the title companies concerned that a mortgage or other lien or judgment might have been filed that will will affect their title um, and the insurance they're giving. So in most cases, they're asking the sellers to give a gap indemnity to cover that risk to say, yes, I haven't given any mortgage. I haven't you know, had any liens or judgments against me, those kind of things. But that's just something that's relatively new. Um, as far as tenants in New Jersey, the governor did sign an executive order allowing renters to pay their rent with their security deposit. The tenant has to replenish that within six months from the end of the emergency. Um, and also, the, the, the governor also issued an order requiring removal of a tenant by eviction. Um, so that's going to continue for two months after the emergency is lifted. So if you're a landlord, your hands are really tied. Um, and these are just, you know, designed to protect people from getting, getting kicked out of their properties. And the last thing um, I just wanted to talk about is the homeowners. Um, David mentioned a little bit about the mortgage forbearance. Over 4 million homeowners across the country have requested mortgage forbearance and taken advantage of that. Um, and it does allow you to miss payments um, and tack it onto the end of the loan. Um, and that is, that's all I have to say. Um, look forward to answering any questions you might have afterwards. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. I think we are uh, about to enter a world where pretty much everything is drive through. So it's uh, interesting that this is now uh, echoing that a little bit. Uh, we are going to head over to our first realtor, Nikki. Uh, Nikki, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, so COVID-19, what did it do to the buyer's market? It seems to have done nothing, nothing bad at all, which we're all surprised and thoroughly happy with. What was amazing was that right before this, um, the South Jersey area turned into strictly a seller's market. Sellers that were priced well, that showed well, were getting multiple offers over asking. And then, you know, in the middle of March, everything stopped. Um, but by the time the governor said that real estate is essential, the buyers all came back, as did the sellers. And um, the same thing has been happening, that there's been a certain price range in South Jersey that is still getting multiple offers over asking. And the vacant homes in particular are flying off the market because that's obviously the type of house that people feel most comfortable to see. Um, but if your house is priced well, and by that, I mean, if you listen to your realtor, who's giving you a price based on the data, and I think that's what our governor advises for everything right now, that all decisions should be made based on data. So if you listen to your realtor, um, stage it well, it looks good. The buyers are there, they're ready and waiting. And the best part that's come out of Corona for a buyer's agent is that these buyers are all extremely serious they're well vetted they're good listeners they have gotten pre-approved first some are further along in the process but my partner and i have had zero lookers um all of our buyers have been very serious and pulled the trigger listened to what we said and like i said many have offered 
over asking, lost it multiple times, you know, offered over asking again and again. The inventory is so low. It is such a good time to be a seller. Um, the precautions that we're taking, I feel like we, we're like scrubbing in for a surgery before every house we go into. Everyone, the buyers and myself, we have gloves, masks, booties, Lysol wipes, enter home. Um, right now, we're asking all the sellers to have every closet door, every pantry door, every light on. Um, like I said, all the doors open, everything so that we don't have to touch a thing. But if we do, we're touching it with a glove on and a Lysol wipe. Um, but everyone has been so compliant and it's been a, a really lovely time for us uh, to be showing considering how serious everyone has been. So it's been great. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. And uh, we have Ben with us. He's going to tell us a little bit more about the seller side. So Ben. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you, Charlene and Ronit and all of uh, the Federation for having us. And uh, Ken, David, Nikki, great to be here with you guys. Uh, second of all, I hope everyone's healthy, happy, safe, doing your distancing, staying at home and taking care of yourselves because that's first and foremost. Um, I will touch on a few things that everyone else said a little bit that there are definitely some challenges in selling real estate during this pandemic and understanding that is a key component for uh, being on the same page with both buyers and sellers. However, real estate transactions are still happening. As Nikki said, uh, deals are being closed. Everyone's becoming more creative and more patient and the drive through closings are a thing. Sellers are coming in uh, the day before closing and signing everything. So it's just the buyers and the title processor that are signing on the day of closing. Um, there is now a COVID addendum that is being signed at the beginning of each transaction by the sellers. And we leave it on the, on when you enter the door on a little table, if there is one there uh, for buyers to come in stating that the sellers haven't had any, um, any COVID symptoms or any symptoms in general. So it's showing that they're taking care of themselves. And then we also, as sellers, are, we're asking the sellers to, we're asking the buyers to have it signed prior to coming in to make sure that they haven't been exposed, that they aren't showing any symptoms or anything like that. And as Nikki said, we are, it is like going into surgery where gloves, masks, Purell, uh, can't tell you how many bottles we have because we have to keep them, you know, for our clients, um, booties, et cetera. And then, you know, a lot of times the sellers, they'll be at home and there's not really anywhere to go. So they'll just leave the door open, say, come on in. And, you know, we're just going to drive around the block and then because where, where are they going to go? You know, there's no, only so many places and it's really just in their car. Um, some things that I'm advising to my clients and other people are as well is we tell them to clean and declutter and clean, 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 uh, which is on everyone's mind these days, but decluttering and making your house stage well and look nice and fresh and sparkle, uh, are key components because then we can take the pictures because so much is done online to try to drive these buyers in it, unless it looks great, like perfectly immaculate, you know, buyers are going to be turned away because they're going to go to the homes that are looking great. And that's true, the true advice that we give normally, but even more so now, because if buyers are going to come to your house and, and make that risk and make that decision to see your house, they're going to want to make sure it's worth it. Um, some other things to do now while you're at home is you know, repainting walls, doing some touch up on some scuff marks, fix any loose handles, squeaky doors. Um, once you, you know, have all that, then it's easier for, you want these buyers to come in and be wowed and see that nothing is wrong with the house. You know, they'll obviously go through inspections where some things will come up, but nothing is really, you know, visibly wrong and it looks great and they want to see it. Um, in order to minimize any potential transfer of germs when showing, uh, I advise, we all advise all our sellers to turn on all lights, open all closet doors, bedroom doors, any pathways. So we minimize the risk of any handles or doorknobs being touched. Um, we also, like we've mentioned, uh, this COVID certification that is signed prior to listing, 
Um, one thing uh, with scheduling showings is it has become a little more challenging because we have to give a buffer of time for when people could come in and out, usually about a half hour because sometimes people linger and you don't want other times before COVID, we would have overlapping showings, but now we really make sure that no one is overlapping with each other. Um, as Nikki said, buyers are very active and very serious, and we won't even allow them to come in unless they are pre-approved pre to make sure that they're serious and they're on it because as David said, their interest rates are so low that all these buyers are jumping in and they want to get into that house ASAP. A lot of these buyers are coming either from their renting and their first time home buyers or they're moving out of the city and they want that yard and space to do something other than just being cooped up inside. Um, and you know, some people who, whether they're upsizing or downsizing and they want to move, it's a project to do this summer and it keeps them, you know, entertained if, things are going to be closed this summer and they're not going to have places to send their kids to camp or, or otherwise, which I won't be the bearer of bad news if that happens. Um, but um, having a project of, you know, being in a house, a new house, repainting, you know, getting some patio, some patio furniture, uh, having a nice cold drink outside. It's, it's a nice, uh, nice thing to do. Um, I will say that in, in Camden County, there are over 400 current listings um, just in the last 30 days. Um, Burlington also over 400 and Gloucester is over 250 and that's still low. So that means there are a ton of buyers out there looking for new homes to come on the market and looking for them to be in great shape. Um, so the demand is definitely there and will continue to be there, uh, I think throughout the year. Um, this summer seems like it's a, going to be a popular summer for people to move. Um, and that's about all I got for that. Thanks, Ben. We actually have questions for all of our panelists uh, that came in. Uh, Nikki, we're actually going to start with you because two questions dovetailed beautifully together. Um, one is uh, someone asked to talk about virtual shows and how that works. But I'd like to add on to that a little bit of how much virtual should be expected, right? Because I think pre-COVID times, maybe people uh, would go online and then reality doesn't always meet. Um, but in this time, our, our realtors showing more virtual, less virtual, and, and what can people who are looking to buy really get to the truth of the matter of what they're looking at? So Nikki, you're up. Um, these are good questions. So normally I would say um, my partner and I have sold probably at least one home virtually. And that's because Philadelphia is such a transient city. People were coming from around the country and had to buy a home within a month and they would do it virtually. And that, that was nuts. And we even thought that was nuts at the time. And now all of a sudden it's practically normal. So a lot of sellers are providing um, videos and it's not just a video of their pictures, it's actual video around the house. Some are doing 3D tours and it is actual 3D. You can spin yourself around a room. You can take yourself on a tour. It's called a matter, Matterport, but it's amazing. And these pictures, now that everything is so high quality in HD, they're, they're really, they really tell the truth. They really do. And I think all the, you know, all the sellers agents and listing agents have been so honest with their pictures. I know on our team, if somebody gives feedback saying that basement looks bigger than I thought, then we take it down and put down, put up a picture of what the basement really looks like. So I think the seller agents have been so much better than ever about telling the truth in their pictures. And again, like what Ben said, everybody's doing such a good job cleaning and staging that when you get there and you finally see it, which may not be until settlement or may not be until the inspection, that what you saw is what you thought. And that's, that's been another great thing that's come out of this is that now we can all trust that process. And as realtors, we know how to streamline it and make it real um, instead of just make it look good. So we have sold more virtual, more homes virtually in the past two months than in probably all the years combined. And even tomorrow morning, we have somebody coming. It's a luxury home. It's a high end. And they're going to see it for the first time right before the inspection. Um, 
in that case, the house is a young home. It's only four years old, but that between the younger homes and the vacant homes, they're flying off the market for those reasons, because you can trust what you're seeing a little bit better online um, and virtually. And the other thing that my partner and I do, if there aren't virtual tours available, or if that's just not good enough, we'll ask if we can come FaceTime our client there. And then they can say, wait, stop, let me see that again. Or give me an idea, you've seen all the houses, how big does that yard look compared to another home that we've seen? Or, you know, um, just sort of comparing it live. It, it's like, we are the, suddenly the most creative people out there, but it, <laughs> it's worked. You know, people have really been happy with what they've seen. I haven't had one person come say yet, like, oh, this is not what I thought it was. So it's been, that's, it's been, uh, I mean, shockingly, surprisingly, just fine. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nikki. All right, I'm going to head over to David for this question. All right, it's a very specific question. So the answer may be they need to contact you directly. Um, but they have a 30-year mortgage. Interest rate is 3.8. Uh, they've been in the home for four years. Uh, will it benefit them to switch to a 15-year mortgage rate at 2.5%? And then I'll dovetail a second question that's similar is really when do people know when they should refinance or not? Well, I, th I think it's on an individual basis, but if you're at a 3.8 uh, and 30 year, I think the math works to go into a 15 year at two and a half percent or the rates might be even lower now, but certainly, um, you know, to save that much interest. Any Anytime you go from a 30 year to a 15 year, you're saving a considerable amount of interest over the life of the loan. Now, you know, most people don't live in that in the home long enough to pay off their mortgage. Um, but from the standpoint that if you're in the home, um, if you think you're going to be in the home for another, let's say four, five, six, seven years, there's de a definite benefit to go from a 30 year to a 15 year, because what you'll find, especially in year four on a 30 year, you're still paying that much more in interest over principal. When you get into a 15 year, uh, it's much more principal in addition to the interest expense. So if you were gonna look at your amortization schedule for your mortgage debt at 30 years, and you compare it to 15 years, you would be looking at, uh, oh my God, I got to do this because the amount of amount of interest that you're saving over the course of, of that time is is absolutely phenomenal. And, and, you know, right now with the rates as low as they are and probably going to get lower, um, it, it's so appealing to really follow up on that. And, you know, I try to practice what I preach. I'm doing that for myself right now going into a 15 year. All right, if David's doing it himself, you know that that's, uh, that's like true expert, uh, inside personal. That, that's insider information. Inside, that's the word. Without me getting into trouble. <laughs> exactly. So Ken, we had a few questions on where people would find and really understand some of these, like the virus addendum and things like that. How do people have access? Do they just need to connect with, with their attorney, with you? How does that work? Um, most of the addendums are part of the standard realtor's form of contract. So I, I, just to ballpark, I'd guess maybe 90 or 95% of the residential deals in the state are done on this form contract. So, you know, any realtor, you could probably even Google it and find it pretty easily. And, you know, the, the addendum that I was talking about um, just, you know, basically says that we're in a pandemic, you might not be have access to realtors, mortgage companies, you know, there's going to be delays that is outside of everyone's control. And it just basically agrees that everyone's going to be, you know, a little flexible to accommodate the uncertainty. You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> when, do you, <laughs> when do you think in this climate, um, can it's really important that they reach out to an attorney? Um, well, people unfortunately get themselves into trouble. And, uh, you know, I had a client that came to me, they signed an agreement of sale, 
five or six months ago. And that was the time to, to reach out to me because when they got involved, you know, when they came to me, it's like, all right, I signed this contract. I don't have a mortgage contingency. I don't have a sale contingency. Um, I haven't been able to sell my home. I can't afford to buy the new home and now I'm stuck. Can you get me out of it? And you know, the, the time to talk to someone is, you know, when you're signing that contract at the latest during the three day attorney review period. Nikki had her hand up. She wanted to, you want to I ask second that? that. I third that. And I agree. During these times, we're almost not giving an option to our buyers. Um, and even the ones that are attorneys, we're telling them to skip being the hero and go hire a real estate attorney. There's just no room for error. There's enough that's going on that could create an error. We don't need anyone's judgment or lack of experience to have anything to do with it. All right, that was a, that's a unanimous on all of our panelists. Yes. <laughs> ben is I do. <laughs> all right, we have, uh, we're, we're actually at our extended time, but I, there's a few questions for you, Ben, that I'd love to get in. Um, sure. So one is, how would you give an immune compromised seller confidence to put their home on the market? And then I'll add the second question, total non sequitur, is this a bad time to sell my house? Which I think Nikki and you sort of answered a little bit, but um, a little further. Sure. Um, so the necessary precautions, first of all, I would say to someone, if you are immunocompromised, that your health is most important. So if you're uncomfortable with someone coming into your home, then you know, you have to take care of yourself and that's understandable. However, with all of the precautions that everyone's taking with the masks, the gloves, the wiping down doors, wiping down handles, um, you making sure that you're out of the house with enough time for then the buyers to come in. Um, these are all steps that everyone's taking, making sure that you're not um, exposed or showing symptoms and that they're not showing symptoms either. Um, and in addition to that, uh, something that I've been doing is that for, for my sellers, um, after the buyers come in, I'll come back and wipe, you know, the door handles, uh, the lockbox, anything else, just, just extra, extra precautions that way. Um, and the confidence in selling now is that inventory is low, so you're probably going to get it sold. Um, so if that's your goal, the buyers are out there looking for your house to pop on the market. Um, but you know, you want to make sure at the same time, you're as protected as possible. Thank you, Ben. I'm great. I am going to open it up uh, for gallery view so they can see all our fabulous panelists and just really go around. And uh, just one thing that you really want to leave everybody with, what's your sort of one message? Um, and uh, David, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, my message is take advantage of what's out there right now. You know, the mortgage, mortgage uh, industry has been very volatile over many years. I go, I'm old enough to go back to the days when the prime rate was 20% uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, mortgage rates were 18%. Um, now we're talking historically low numbers. Uh, if you feel like there's any opportunity to refinance your mortgage, you should owe it to yourself to, to, to look at it and, and do what's beneficial to yourself. Uh, you'll, you'll reap some financial benefits from that. If um, you're looking to, to buy a home and have a, your first time mortgage, same thing. Take advantage of that. Go get that first home. Go have a, a, a low cost mortgage and don't look back. Thanks, David. Ken? So if you're a buyer, uh, it, again, I would focus on is it, if you can get past your fear, which is what's holding a lot of people back, you know, there's a lot of uh, opportunities out there. So if you're a buyer, go ahead, be confident in the deal, but also protect yourself. And, you know, with some of the contingencies that I mentioned and, you know, again, as a seller, you know, my focus as a seller would be to go with someone who has the deepest pockets, the least contingencies and the, the greatest chance of getting to a closing. Thanks, Ken. All right, Nikki. 
Um, I would say in this time, it is the most important to rely on a team of experts. So choose your agent um, and get approved before you even begin. Be certain that this is something you're willing to do based on the data, the numbers. Um, be prepared to give it your all. Know that you're going to potentially be in a bidding war um, and that there's going to be multiple offers. And like I said, let the expert, the experts on your team lead you, including your attorney. Um, and then finally, although it's a seller's market right now, and that might, that might not you know, be so inviting for a buyer, these buyers have more buying power than ever before. Every $10,000, what is it, $50 now? You go up $50 for every 10,000 now? I think that's where we are. So if a seller comes back and says um, on a counter offer, you need to come up 5,000, it's $25 in your mortgage. I mean, how much better than that can you do? So it's a seller's market, yes, but the power, the buyers have all the power. Thanks, and then. Great. Um, so I would uh, echo sort of what Nikki said about having a great team around you and trusting your people around you. Everyone is doing uh, a lot of creative work with getting the deals to the closing table, having the right attorneys in place, um, having the right lenders in place, knowing that they're able to close the loans, the right title companies that are able to get you from point A to point B. Uh, and the right realtor, as well as a list of vendors that your realtor should have of people, either it's inspectors or just handymen, electricians, et cetera. Um, you know, you want to be able, we're doing is everything that we can to fully understand this and do this in creative ways. And homes are selling. Uh, and like Nikki said, while it's great for a seller's market. It's also great for a buyer's market as well because interest rates are so low, but inventory is so low. So it's sort of a great time for both, for everyone to jump in. And, you know, if you were scared or fearful that we're not able to still close deals, we are still closing deals. Uh, we're just being more creative about it and more efficient as well because things that, you know, were done in person, we can do over a Zoom call or FaceTime or in simple email or text and ev and everyone is working together for the greater good of being able to buy and sell these homes. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to all of our panelists uh, for being here and being experts in, in what you do. We greatly appreciate you taking the time mm -hmm. with us. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, you can reach out to all of our panelists. We will share all of that information along with our next webinar, which is going to be commercial real estate on Thursday, same time, um, different link. So if you want to join us back Thursday, and again, thank you all so, so much for being here today. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to everybody viewing. Thank you. Next time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having us.